I'm Phil Wharton and welcome to our instructional DVD. Today we're going to be talking about active isolated flexibility. And some of the difference of active isolated flexibility and other methods are that we're going to use one muscle group to work and its opposite is going to relax and lengthen. Different from static where we hold positions for 10 seconds, 20 seconds, a minute. Or ballistic where we go too vigorous and pull muscles at their attachments. So thank you for coming. Join us as we take you through some basic examples of active isolated flexibility. Science of flexibility. There is overwhelming research now supporting active flexibility versus static stretching in the last 30 years. Active isolated flexibility does not violate the stretch reflex, Golgi tendon response, or protective mechanism that stops us from overstretching. Static stretching does. All muscles work in pairs. As an agonist muscle works or contracts, its opposite muscle or antagonist relaxes or lengthens. This doesn't occur in static hold positions or stretches. Circulation and blood flow reduce ischemia, move metabolic waste, and speed the recovery process. This does not occur in static positions. Here are some of the basic principles of active isolated flexibility. Number one, the first thing we're going to do is identify the muscle or muscle group to be lengthened. In this case, it's the hamstrings. So, as Erin moves, she's going to be using her opposite muscle or agonist, that's the quadricep or front thigh. As she moves up, and go ahead and move up, Erin. Good. She's using her quadricep to do the work, and then she's going to isolate that rear thigh or hamstring. Hold for a moment, and then come back down. So she's not holding for 10 seconds, 20 seconds a minute, like classic static moves. She's doing a nice continuous motion, hand over hand, she walks up the rope, and before that stretch reflex kicks in, she comes out of the position. So no bouncing or jerking. Coming back to start position, pausing, and going through that full range of motion. So she's isolating the muscle. Then the next thing she's going to do is she's going to breathe. Breathing is so important for oxygenating the blood to fire the muscle. So you're going to exhale as you move up and inhale as you come back to start position. So make sure you're breathing nice and easy as much as through the nose and mouth as possible. Good. Now, she's also going to work with repetitions. She's going to do 8 to 12 repetitions. If something's really contracted, she can go back and do more sets of 10 to 12. Good, Aaron. Let's try one more. Basic principles of active, isolated flexibility. Now we'll go through a few examples of active isolated flexibility. In this case, Steve's on the table and he's going to perform a bent knee hamstring. The hamstring's a two joint muscle. So what we're going to do is get that lower attachment first. Steve uses one hand on the rope and one hand stabilizes that quadricep. And what he's doing is he's using that agonist muscle, in this case, the quadricep to work and the hamstring is going to relax and lengthen. As he's doing this, he's using his breath, exhaling as he works, inhaling as he comes back to start position. He's also trying to find a position that he can fully extend. In this case, Steve's a little tight because he just did a track workout. So we're going to back the angle out off a little bit. And this is going to happen a lot if you try a movement and it's a little too much in that moment. Just back off. Remember, less is more with flexibility. Excellent. And now he's getting into his lower hamstring attachment right there and he's using his agonist muscle to work. He's not violating the stretch reflex because he's not holding the position more than a moment at his end range. Lower hamstring, bent knee hamstring. So here's our second example of active isolated flexibility. Jeff's going to help us demonstrate a full or straight leg hamstring. Same principles here. He's using his agonist muscle, in this case the quadricep. The front thigh is going to lift the leg. Go ahead and lift that leg, Jeff. Hand over hand, he walks up the rope, but he's using the opposite muscle. And that's the key is the rope's just the helper at the end of the range, but he's doing all the work. First, last, and always, he's using his body. And that's one of the beauties of active isolated flexibility is you're your own rope. It's all about you. So the rope or the dog leash, whatever you have around, it's just your helper at the end, just to take you into that 
end of the joint range at the very end of the movement. He's using his breath, exhaling as he moves, inhaling as he comes back to start position. He's not violating the stretch reflex because he's not holding more than one to two seconds at the end of the movement. So it's active isolated flexibility, hamstring, straight leg. Comes all the way back to start position, disengages for a moment, relaxes, then refires the muscle. Notice his pace. If you feel like you're going too fast, it may become ballistic. So you slow yourself down. Flexibility is about relaxation and recovery. The next exercise example is the hip abductor, the outer thigh. This is a great one for your IT band and glute medius. Those are muscles that are easily injured in distance running. A lot of it because of the different cambers of roads, the crown or crest of the road puts us in a, in a, in a sort of a compromising position. So here's your fix for that. The non-working or opposite leg is going to turn in on you, Colin. The working or exercising leg is going to turn out. It's almost as if both the toes are like windshield wipers in a car pointing the w opposite way that you're going. You're going to straighten that leg and lock it in and then you're going to use that inner thigh. So his agonist muscle in this case is the adductor or groin muscle. He's just going to come right across the midline of the body and go as low as you can while clearing the opposite thigh. So the more he turns out, good. The deeper he'll get in there and his hands can kind of walk up the rope, but he's using his muscles here to work. His opposite muscles will relax and lengthen. That's the targeted area and that hip abductor. And the more you turn out, Colin, the deeper it'll go. That's good. And I'll just assist you with one there. Great. Right in that hip. Do you feel that? I do. Good. Excellent. Hip abductor. Here's our last example. We want to realize that all runners, some of them do flexibility or stretching, but nobody thinks about the upper body and neck. Very important for opening up the chest and getting you running with the whole body. So Aaron's going to demonstrate an upper body exercise example of the chest or pectoralis major. So she's going to start with her elbows locked, she's using her abdominals so she doesn't arch the back, and she's reaching behind her with her upper back muscles, coming back to start position. So her opposite muscles are right here in the upper trap and rhomboid, and she's lengthening all through the upper chest. Pec major, pec minor, really good. Each repetition, she's going up a little higher because those muscles are fan-shaped in nature, so we want to hit different fibers as we go. Good. She's using the breath, exhaling as she moves, inhaling as she comes back to start position. And if you have a friend around, you can assist a little bit at the end of the movement. She's not holding. She's going through a continuous motion through her full range, her own natural range, and not arching the back. This will help so much with your postural alignment in your upper back, your upper thoracic spine. Excellent. For more information on our work, including books, videos, clinics and workshops, go to wartonperformance.com or and wartonhealth.com. It's been a pleasure to share this work with you. Enjoy your training and stay healthy.